This is a presentation on post-structuralism and deconstruction as introduced in Peter Barry's book, Beginning Theory. First, a brief review of structuralism. It's a field that started when Ferdinand de Saussure took language study to a new level by studying the way language works as opposed to former studies of language that looked at its history. What Saussure said is that language is a science system with signifiers and signified. Where? One, the relationship, he said, between the signified or the concepts and the signifier or the words themselves is arbitrary. This is clear to understand when we look at one signified, this shape, the tree, which is called tree in one language, arb in another, and shajara in a third. So having more than one signifier, almost randomly chosen, this according to Saussure, and of course many other examples, uh, is proof that the meaning or the word or the signifier is chosen arbitrarily to indicate a certain signified. Second, Saussure points out that the meaning of words is relational. So shed, its meaning is related to another type of dwelling, which is house, and the relation between them is a relationship of size. So we understand shed because it's smaller than house, house smaller than mansion, mansion smaller than castle. All these are types of dwellings where the meaning is determined by their differences from one another, which is a relational difference because there is a relation between them. And in this case, the difference is identified by the size. Finally, he says that language constitutes reality and doesn't just reflect it. So for example, when one person is called a terrorist, it is defined as a terrorist, their actions are defined as a terrorist action, uh, whereas the same action can be taken by someone else. When that person is called freedom fighter, we accept them to be freedom fighters, regardless of the fact that both might be conducting the same actions. Now, Susora thus set, sets the ground for structuralist theories, from which springs the, the next theory, which is post-structuralism. Peter begins the chapter on post-structuralism and deconstruction by presenting post-structuralism as some sort of rebellion against the inability of structuralist theories to follow their convictions in terms of how language doesn't reflect reality, but constitutes, constitutes it, which is what was mentioned in the previous slides. The argument here is that since structuralists argue that language doesn't reflect reality but shapes it or makes it, then we are taken into a universe of uncertainty with no reference point of knowledge that we can trust. And that by this decentering of the universe, we are left not knowing where we are, with everything that we learned lost or deconstructed. This results in a natural anxiety over the inability of language to express what we really want to say. According to post-structuralist thinkers, this would have been the natural outcome of a structuralist line of thought, the outcome that results in a decentering of the universe and the loss of meaning and the natural anxiety that results from that. The book introduces, introduces us to a comparison between structuralism and post-structuralism using four major points. First, Barry refers to the origins of each of these theories, structuralism having its origins based on a scientific look into the, what they're studying, whereas post-structuralism has a philosophical type of origin. The distinction is also find, found in the tone and style where a structuralist discourse is abstract and neutral whereas a post-structuralist one is emotive and engaged. In terms of language, structuralism sees it as an ordered system as opposed to the floating and fluid nature of language in post-structural the structural theories. Finally, in terms of their aims or their projects, structuralism aims to show us the way to break free of habits and build new ones that make more sense for us 
whereas post-structuralists distrust all habits and the very notion of reason or sense. The book presents us with the thoughts of two main critics associated with post-structuralism, Roland Barthes and Jacques Derrida. In one of Roland Barthes' most important works, Death of the Author, Barth frees the text from the intentions or the context, the intention of the author or, or the context in which the book is written or read. And with that, he proclaims the death of the author and that the author no longer matters and the long life of the reader as the creator of meaning. This allows for the endless free play of meaning that Bart is very known to push for. As for Jacques Derrida, his, his influence on structuralism is seen and post-structuralism is seen in two major works. In Structure, Sign and Play, Derrida discusses the decentering of our intellectual universe as a result of one, the events of World War I, specifically the Holocaust, two, the scientific advancement and specifically the notion of relativity that shook our belief that time and space are fixed entities, and three, the, the many artistic revolutions that played freely with forms of music and art. The result of this was a liberating decentering of the universe. Liberating is a key term here. A year after Structure, Sign and Play, Derrida published Of Grammatology, in which he calls for a deconstructive reading of texts to divorce them or free them again from their former unity insisting that reading and interpretation is a form of double commentary or reconstruction of the text, and that critical reading is about the reproduction of the text. His famous saying, there is nothing outside the text, is still the subject of multiple discussions and commentaries, thus drawing our focus again to analyzing the, tep the depth of the text itself. As practical tools, looking at the differences between structuralism and post-structuralism can help us formulate a process to conduct either theory as a practical reading of text. So, an analysis of the two or a comparison of the two. Whereas structuralism looks at parallels and echoes, post-structuralism looks at contradictions and paradoxes. A structuralist looks for balances. A post-structuralist looks for shifts and breaks in tone, viewpoint, tense, time, person, attitude. A structuralist looks or, or, or seeks reflections and repetitions. A post-structuralist looks for conflicts. A structuralist looks for symmetry. symmetry. A post-structuralist for absences and omissions. Contrasts for structuralists as opposed to linguistic quirks for post-structuralists. Patterns for structuralists or structures. Aporia for a post-structuralist. Structuralists look for this effect, which is to show the textual unity and coherence or structure of the text. Post-structuralists look for this effect, which is to show textual disunity. To recap and to best prepare you to attempt a deconstructive reading of text, this is what a post-structuralist critic can do. You read the text against itself, against its intended meaning. You intentionally look for a meaning that the text did not intend. You make the surface features critical to the meaning. They are no longer just surface features. You show the discontinuities rather than the unities found in the text. You focus on and analyze single passages, a deep reading. You look for breaks in the text, all again in the aim of focusing on how language escapes definitions, how language offers a free play, and how words or signifiers do not necessarily point to a signified. 
So the intention of a post-structuralist critic is to decenter a work of literature because the main aim or the general look is that language is decentered or lacking in structure. The chapter ends with an example of a deconstructive analysis of Dylan Thomas's poem, A Refusal to Mourn the Death by Fire of a Child in London, using three stages that Barry defined as, the three deconstructive stages that Barry defined as a verbal stage, a textual stage, and a linguistic stage. I will read the poem, then demonstrate each of these three stages. A Refusal to Mourn by Death the death by fire of a child in London. Never until the mankind making bird, beast, and flower, fathering in all humbling darkness, tells with silence the last light breaking, and the still hour is come of the sea tumbling in harness, and I must enter again the round Zion of the water bead, and the synagogue of the ear of corn. Shall I let pray the shadow of a sound? or sow my salt seed in the least valley of sackcloth to mourn the majesty and burning of a child's death. I shall not murder the mankind over her going with a grave truth, nor blaspheme down the stations of the breath with any further elegy of innocence and youth. Deep with the first dead lies London's daughter, robed in the long friends the grains beyond age, the dark veins of her mother, secret by the unmourning water of the riding Thames. After the first death, there is no other. Now, to deconstruct the poem with the reference to the verbal stage, the verbal stage, that kind of deconstruction, is done by looking at the paradoxes and contradictions in the use of the words themselves, hence verbal. So for example, when the speaker says, after the first death, there is no other, this is an obvious, obvious contradiction within this sentence itself, as the term first supposes that there should be a second and a third and so forth. So the contradictions or failure, the failures of language are found within this specific line. A textual analysis or a deconstructive textual analysis looks at a more overall view of the whole poem in this case and analyzes shifts or breaks of continuity. For example, the first two stanzas imagine the passing of ages, while the third stanza looks at the present, only to jump us again in the last stanza with a historical look into London, thus disrupting the unity or the continuity of the text. The linguistic stage looks at a bigger picture when language fails in general, as when in this poem, as per the title, we read that the speaker refuses to mourn the death, but the poem itself is a poem of mourning. So this refus refusal, which is manifest in the title of the poem uh, defeats the purpose of the poem because the poem is a poem of, of mourning. So his utterance or the poem itself goes against the intention of the poem. You're reading the poem against its intention. The intention or the, procre the proclaimed, proclaimed intention is to refuse to mourn when the poem is a poem of mourning. The language here uh, or the language trap is very significant for a post-structural critic as it shows the fractured nature of language. There are of course other elements that can be deconstructed in the poem. The examples should provide a beginning to how a deconstructive reading of the next book or the next poem can take place.